<clears throat> we got uh, Tuesday, Thursday. We got through uh, page seventy-three, which was chapter four, and I had asked for, if possible, to try to get through or two. I think it was chapter twenty today. I don't know that we'll get that far, but we will. Um, <clears throat> we'll do our best. So, picking up with chapter five. Hold on a second. Let me get a <clears throat> picking up with chapter five. Um, Sabriel goes on to. Cloven Crest, which is where there was a charter stone, and notice <clears throat> this comes, all this information here comes very late in the model. Well, chapter 17, 18, something like that. <clears throat> okay. So we have a charter stone referred to and do we still know what let me rephrase that do we know yet what the charter is no okay why not by that i mean why has it mixed holes Okay, <clears throat> even though she's been trained to be an ab person and has finished the Book of the Dead, right? She doesn't fully understand it. Um, so what is Nick's doing? Think of narrative kind of structure. We're being introduced to a lot of these concepts the exact same time she is. So just as she's in the dark about some things at least, we are equally in the dark, okay? So we're learning along as she kind of learns along. Obviously, she knows more than we do. She's been into, you know, dead and all that kind of stuff. So, page 76. She gets there. There's charter marks on the stone, but they're frozen. Notice when she gets to the wall, what are the marks on the wall doing? They're moving all around. When she gets to where the soldiers are, just before the wall, and she sees some of their swords, the swords have marks that are moving. That is, the marks, which are part of the charter, or part of a charter, okay, they're alive there, right? This stone, however, is not moving, or the marks aren't moving. The stone seems to be dead. And we're told, middle of 76, only some terrible power of free magic could split a charter stone. Okay? And there's a... Let's see if I... And there's that phrase again that we've seen before. Free magic, and there's... Charter magic, right? Those seem to be somewhat opposed. Or charter magic is free magic that is what? Order. Order. It's no longer free. It's bound. It's it's controlled in some way. Right? So she goes closer to the stone, you know, fear rising, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. She sees something on the stone, and she realizes, you know, these dark marks are blood. All right? A charter mage, page 77, had been sacrificed on the stone. So there's, you know, another term that we've already seen, a charter mage. Mage is short for magic, one who does magic. So this, somebody who performed charter magic has been sacrificed, essentially, or at the very least, 
just slain <coughs> on the stone. Okay? Sacrifice by a necromancer to gain access to death or to help a dead spirit break through into life. The same kind of necromancer that she is? No. This is the person who uses death in magic to bring out of death. Her form of necromancy is to do what? To send farther and farther into death. Okay? So, she thinks of what she needs to do. She thinks only a top of 78, only a powerful necromancer could use that spell. Okay? Um, but she goes into death. But before she does, pages 80 and 81, she's preparing herself and she gives us, or the narrator gives us, through her thinking, the list of the bells that are on the bandolier that runs across her chest. Okay? It starts from the smallest and goes to the largest. Now, the bells are going to be really, really important through all three novels. Okay? Page 80 and 81. Rana. Smallest bell. Sleep bringer. Okay. Sweet low sound that brought silence in its wake. So you ring this bell, and whoever hears it, they go to sleep. Moss rail, the second bell, a harsh, rowdy bell, kind of a clangy sound. Moss rail was the waker. The bell Sabriel should never use. The bell whose sound was a seesaw, throwing the ringer further into death as it brought the listener into life. So if you use this one, all right, you've got to be in death to use this, all right? Well, that's not quite accurate. It's best to be in death to use most of them, okay? So this one you use in death to bring things that are not past the ninth gate closer and closer to life, but in doing so, the person ringing the bell who hears it goes farther and farther into that. Okay. Kibbeth, the walker. It could give freedom of movement to one of the dead or walk them through the next gate. Dira, a musical bell. It was the voice that the dead so often lost. Okay. But it could also stop a tongue that talks too much. Belgeir, or Belgeir, however you pronounce it, the thinking bell, the bell most necromancers scorn to use. It could restore independent thought, memory, and all the patterns of a living person. Or it could erase them. So notice, it's kind of like knife's edge. You use it incorrectly, and it does the opposite of what you want to do. Serana, the deepest, lowest bell. That is, the one with the deepest kind of, you know, bass sound. The sound of strength. Seraneth, or Serenef, whichever, was the binder, the bell that shackled the dead to the wielder's will. That is, it allows the dead to come out of death, but that individual, take that back, that dead is not an individual, has no freedom of choice, right? And then lastly, Astorael, the sorrowful, the banisher, the final bell. Properly done, notice it's not just ring the bell and whatever. Properly done, everyone who hears it goes far into death, including the ringer. So put earplugs in. <clears throat> and so she kind of goes up and down, which one am I going to do? And she settles on Rana first and then settles on Saranath. Okay, which one was Saranath again? The binder. The bell that shackled the dead to the wielder's will. Okay. So she gets ready to go into death. And we're told. She takes the bell. She holds the clapper, you know, the thing inside that bangs against this thing. And with her right hand, she pulls out her sword. So she's holding the bell in the left, sword in the right. 
She sees the charter marks, and we're told, unseen, page 82, by Sabriel, the inscription began again, but parts of it were not the same. That is, as she's holding it, the inscription on the sword changes. It becomes something else. I was made for Abhorsa, to slay those already dead, you know, to kill the killed, was what it usually said. Now, it continued. That is, now, suddenly, seemingly, for the first time, but bear in mind, she doesn't see this. The narrator is telling us this. Okay? Now it also says, the Claire saw me, the wall maker made me, the king quenched me, the abhorson wields me. At this point, we have no idea who the Claire are. We really don't know who the wall maker is, other than she went through a wall to get to the old kingdom, right? So it's whoever made that, okay? We don't know who the king is. <coughs> the only one we kind of know, very vaguely, is Abhorsen. All these other things, pure mysteries, all right? So she goes into death. She feels the pull of the river and such. And we're going to skip a bit. Chapter 6. She's off into of death, and something senses charter magic on Cloven Crest. Okay? Starts following her or coming towards her, etc. Um, page 89. She, having gone into death, you know, kind of speaks to her mother, so to speak, all right? And it tells her where to go, this sending of sorts, what place to head towards, and she comes back, um, I want to make sure I've got this right. Yeah, comes back out of death, and here's the, you know, curse you. I will tell the servants of Caragor, I will be revenged. His grotesque helping voice was chopped off in mid-sentence as Throck, Throck lost free will. Page 95. Saranus had bound him, Kibeth gripped him, Kibeth walked him, walked him so Throck could be no more, etc. Okay. So, she flees to do what her mother said, to make her way towards, you know, that cave and passage and such. Pages 106, 107. We're going to, you know, skip a lot and then stop and then skip a lot and kind of stop. Um, she gets into the, that kind of passageway and a man just kind of materializes out of the middle of the wall. We're told, bottom of 106. Sword comes whistling down on the Mordekin's arm, biting out, biting out a chunk of burning rotten flesh. The Mordekin howls, it backs away. Whatever this thing was, it was a charter ghost, ascending. Okay? She asks, she thanks it, she says, will it get through? It nods. Okay? She goes on, it stays there to protect her. Um, the Mordekin gets past, page 112. She hears the sound, as she gets to the end of the passageway, she hears the sound of running water. Okay, so, big deal. Well, we're told, as she goes through the door, she makes her way across, and... Page 114. She sees out on, or she's before she makes her way across. She sees out on the middle of the island, Ab Horson's house. She'd been there a couple of times, maybe three. She couldn't remember how to get to the house. Why? Because she's on one bank. There's a couple hundred yards of swiftly flowing water. There's the island with the big house. 
And though you can't see it, on the other side, there's another couple hundred yards of open water. Okay? All she remembers is the words her mother, sending had told her, Ab Horson's Bridge. She hadn't realized she'd spoken these words aloud till the little gate warden tucked her to sleep and points down. Okay? Steps leading right down to the river. So she goes down to the river and what? What does this essentially require? Think Indiana Jones, which one? Yes. Where he has to take the step of faith, you know, walk out into the chasm, and then the camera does this and gets us that little side perspective where we can see the bridge, okay? So, she can see the stepping stones under the water. She goes out, and notice page 116. She gets halfway out. 100, water, 100 yards of pure, ferocious water behind her. She stops and turns and looks back. Okay. And there's the Mordecai at the edge. No sign of the gate warden. Not surprising. That is, it was gone. Okay. But he can't move. Why? There's something about rushing water. We don't know yet why. Only it can't move through the rushing water. So she makes her way the rest of the way across. She gets to the house. She gets to the doorstep. You know, big door, lion head knocker and stuff. And there's a cat. And she collapses. Bottom 118, top of 119. She looks at the cat, and we're told she reached down to pat the cat and froze. For as the cat thrust its head up, she saw the collar around its neck and the tiny bell that hung there. Okay? She's got seven bells across her chest, and the cat has a bell. It ought to ring a bell. That is, it ought to tell us there's something about bells, first of all. Okay? The fact that she has bells and the cat has bell has a bell should mean there's some kind of connection. The collar was only red leather, <coughs> but the charter spell on it was the strongest, most enduring binding, binding notice that Sabriel had ever seen or felt. Now notice again, it is a charter spell and it's binding something. So what does that mean? It binding some kind of free magic because that's what charter spells do. Okay? That let me rephrase that. That's one of the things they do. You can also, you know, conjure up things that don't have anything to do with that. But this is a binding spell. And if it's binding, it's binding something that is naturally unbound. Free, in other words. And the bell was a miniature serenade. Okay, go back to the bells. And what is? I just had it marked. I just had that page open. I did. Serenade, the deepest, lowest bell, page 81, sound of strength. It was the binder, the belt that shackled the dead to the wielder's will. All right? This is a binding bell. And the bell was a miniature serenade. The cat was no cat, but a free magic creature of ancient power. Okay, so not only is there free magic, but there are free magic creatures. What? What does that imply? How do we interpret that? Creatures made of free magic? Yes, that's what it is. Okay. Do we know yet what free magic is? No idea. We don't even know where the med... Well, how do I put this? Oh, I can't see. Um... We don't even know where the magic came from or what the origins of the magic are or what the origins of anything 
you know, so to speak, is. Okay? And the cat says, Abhorson, about time you got here. Notice the cat doesn't say Sabriel. Okay? It immediately knows. 121. Who? What are you? Why does she go from who to what? Not a cat. It just has the appearance of a cat. Okay? <clears throat> I have a variety of names. You may call me Moggett. As to what I am, I was once many things, but now I am only several. Does that sound like anybody we've read about before? I don't know about you, but I hear Bartimaeus there. You know, I don't. I don't think there's any relation. There's no. There's no influence. It just sounds like Bartimaeus to me, speaking about his existence, say in the other place, right? Because in the other place, Bartimaeus is kind of what everything. Everything is mixed together. Why? Because there's no finiteness there. So here, whatever Mog is. He's saying, yeah, I used to be many, now I'm just several. I'm a servant of Abhorson. Unless you'd be kind enough to remove my collar. So what does the collar mean? What does a cat mean? What does Moggett mean? By, you know, I'm a servant of Abhorson unless you want to remove my collar. Well, what have we already been told? What kind of magic does she see on the call? Charter magic, binding magic. Remove my collar, and Moggett is suggesting, I will be unbound. I will be free. In which case, I will no longer be a servant of Abhorson. So what does he mean by servant? What's really meant by servant? Okay, keep going. Servant's a nice term for what he really is. Slave. Prisoner. Okay. And she kind of looks at him and goes, mm, no. Whatever Margaret was, that collar was the only thing that kept it as a servant of Abhorson or anything else. The charter marks were quite explicit. Notice, we're not told what the charter marks say, but the charter marks kind of say, don't ever take the collar off. <laughs> okay. And the binding spell, she could kind of tell, is over a thousand years old. So the cat thing is over a thousand years old. It was quite possible that Moggett was some free magic spirit as old as the wall. Or maybe older. Okay. So... She and the cat, she and Margaret talk. They talk about the house. They talk about the sendings that are in the house, the ghost-like things that kind of, you know, serve her, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Margaret tells all the things. She's the new ab person. You have to serve her. Page 130. <coughs> Sabriel says, how did you know I was coming? I mean, I didn't even know till, till, uh, Till father sent his message. Top of 131. I have served ten times as many of your forebears as you have years. How old is she again? She's 18. He has served 180 ab horses. We're not told how many years he's served each ab person, but the implication is well over a thousand years. Okay. And though my powers wane <coughs> with the ebb of time, I always know when one abhorson falls and another takes their place. It, it's almost like this world cannot exist without an abhorson. When one dies, there's always one waiting in the wings. She says, what do you mean by fall? He's dead. 131. 
Even if he hasn't passed the final gate, he will walk in life no more. That she goes, no, he can't be. He, he's a necromant. He can't be. You know, that's why he sent the sword and bells to you. As his aunt sent them to him. So, little family history here. You know, when an aunt person is dying or has gone past the first gate, that's when the aunt person sends the bells and sword to the aunt person in waiting. And notice he clarifies. He corrects her. He wasn't the necromancer. He was Aborism. See, Margaret just taught her something important. Because she said she was a necromancer to Horace. He says, no. Necromancers are evil. <laughs> he doesn't say this. Necromancers, though, are evil. They don't bind the dead. They raise the dead. Okay? Why do you say his name, 132, as if it were a title? It is. He was the Abhorson. Now you are. And she's not going to be called, I'll give away something, she's not going to be called Abhorson Sabriel. She's just going to be called Abhorson. This book is titled Sabriel because she hasn't yet accepted that title. When we get to the end, she will. No, I can't say that yet. <clears throat> so, 133. She says, he's not yet truly dead. He's not dead dead. You know, he's mostly dead. I felt his presence, though he is trapped beyond many gates. I could bring him back. Okay? Trap beyond many gates. We talked the other day <coughs> about, you know, there are, we haven't heard this yet. I'm giving, you know, stuff away. That there are nine gates. By the way, there's a biblical kind of basis for this. I don't mean that there are nine gates, but that there are gates of death. i got a note written here. Job 38, can't tell if it's 7, I think it's 38, 17. Have the, uh, can't read my writing. Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Okay. Now, you can understand that to mean gates like, you know, gate like this, or gate, gate, gate. Because deepest darkness kind of implies, you know, this progression maybe regression, whichever term would be. She says, I could bring him back. No, Mogi says. Why? Notice, she said, he is trapped beyond many gates. Okay, so there are nine gates to find many. Probably more than two. You know, I kind of would say maybe like near half, so four or five. Okay, so he's not fully dead, but he then becomes what? Mostly dead, so do you want to bring someone back who's mostly dead, and not, you know, resurrection like Lazarus, where he comes back and he's fine, but, you know, little bits of flesh, you know, falling off. You must not. You are abhorsen and must put the dead to rest. Notice, to rest. It's not, and you must damn them to death. Sending them beyond the night gate is a mercy. It's, it's bringing closure. It's bringing completion. It's bringing bliss. It's bringing, you know, the circle of life reaches its perfection, so to speak. All right? She wants to do what? She wants to do necromancy. Why? Because she's inherently evil? No. Because she loves her father. She wants her father back. Even though she hasn't known him very well. She hasn't seen him much in her lifetime. And as we will find out later, 
And when she did, what did he emphasize? Read the book of Gehenna. Learn the stuff. Know it inside out. Okay? But that won't come till later. So, he concludes, bottom 133, your path is chosen. Why? Go back for a second. 56-57. Horus says to her, you have chosen a difficult path. She says, top of 57, does the walker choose the path or the path the walker? Quoting the words at the end of the Book of the Dead. He says, I've heard that before. What does it mean? I don't know. Okay. Moggett says, bottom of 133, your path is chosen. She says, I can walk a different path. My path isn't laid in stone. Damn it, I have free will. I can do what I want. Notice. Margaret seemed about to protest. Do as you will. Why should I gainsay you? I am but a slave bound to service. Would I, why would I weep if Abhorson falls to evil? It's your father who would curse you, and your mother too, <coughs> and the dead who will be with it. Why? Because then the dead will have power because of the necromancers that are around to come back out and live, and there will be no outports to stop them. Sabriel says, I don't think he's dead. His spirit felt alive. He's trapped to death, but his body lives. Okay, so what does that mean? How can his body live if he's trapped in death? What have we seen... In the, how many times have we seen it now? Sabriel in the prologue. And then Sabriel again, I think we've seen three times now. Where people have gone into death. How do they go into death? How does Sabriel, how did Abhorson before, go into death? It is, by the way, an ecstatic experience comes from the Greek ecstasy, or also spelled that way. Okay. That's where the soul leaves the body. The soul goes into death, but what does the body do? What did we see Abhorson's body do in the prologue? You know, he just kind of sat there in whatever, you know, pose he was in, kind of a lotus pose, maybe, and gets ice all over it. Why? Because the heat of the soul, the fire of the body, has gone into death. You see the same thing with Sabriel. Okay? And she's saying his body is still alive. That is, if the body is still alive, then the soul can come back out. Margaret, no. No. He has sent the sword and bell. That's an indication. <laughs> the two, the soul and the body, they will never be joined again. That's why he sent them. She says, I feel it. I must find out if my feeling is true. Margaret, perhaps strange. You know, it could be I'm just grown dull. You know, this, this color. Okay. And so she asks him for help. He says, I need to know. She says, I need to know. Morgan, I am the servant of Abhorson. You are Abhorson, so I must help you. But you must promise me that you will not raise your father if his body is dead. Notice, if his body is dead. We can cut to the end. Eh, not quite the end, but close to the end. When she does finally see her father, his body isn't dead. It's getting close. <laughs> okay. She says, I can't promise, but I will not act without much thought. And I'll listen to you. Okay. 
Um, he says, bottom of 135, your father should never have sent you beyond the wall. Sabriel, why did he? What is that kind of, what's packed in that? Why did he? Why wasn't I raised by him? Why didn't I know him all my life? Right? Because you went up to boarding school. Okay? Necessity. Necessity. What's necessity mean? He had no choice. He had to. Margaret, he was afraid. You were safer in Etchus, dear. What was he afraid of? Intuition. He doesn't answer the question. What was he? Does he ever? Does the question ever get answered? I don't think it does in this book. I'm trying to not fully answer this. I don't think it gets fully answered until we get to the end of the third book. Okay? Chapter 9. So, she has the Book of the Dead, 139, and she says, you know, or Margaret says, I see you found that book. Take care you do not read too much. She says, I've already read it all anyway. Maybe. It's not the same book. Like me, it is several things, not one. Think about that for a moment. <coughs> How many of you have read a book before? Many times. You have a novel that you just, you know, love that you read continuously. I've known people who've read, you know, certain novels once a year for 20, 30 years. All right? Why? Why? When you've already read it, you know what's going to happen? You see things you didn't see before. Okay? Why? Is, is it because the things change in the novel? No. Is that what he means? The book changes here, possibly, because, you know, there's magic and stuff. What changes, you know, I'll use myself as an example. First time I read, what was it? First time I read, let's say, Lord of the Rings, 17. All right? If I read the Lord of the Rings now at nearly 60, what's the difference? 43 years of living difference. That's a pretty big difference. Okay, from 17 to 20, there was three years difference. Okay, the first time I read Lord of the Rings, I read it, and then like uh, two weeks later, I read it again. And just started, you know, same thing kind of with Chronicles and Narnia, Harry Potter stuff. It's the individual that you, okay, so she's read it through once. What does that mean? She's taken that into her. So that now, when she reads it again, she kind of skims over the surface stuff that she knows and starts to see a little bit deeper and deeper. And every time it's read, deeper and deeper. Okay? So, <clears throat> let's see here. Margaret suggests she reads a diary. Um... One forty-one. He tells her a messenger came from Belisere, which is the kind of capital city of the old kingdom. Something dead was preying on them. He says, you know, so he went up there be, to help take care of that. Uh, they start to talk about the charter, and Margaret interrupts, and he tries to say some things, but he can't. Okay, and he tells her it's because of the binding. Can't tell you, page 142, it's part of the binding. Suffice to say, the whole world slides into evil, and many are helping it slide. So, it's up to her to stop the slide. All right? And he points out to her, or ascending points out to her, 
Something's going on back at the cliff edge. And so she goes through the window and she sees. And there's the Mordecai and there's people. And they're bringing piles of dirt. And we're told it's grave dirt. Dirt from graves. Which, as they pile it and pile it, will enable the Mordecai to get across. Okay, Page 147. She talks about the things she slew it. At Cloven Crest, 148, Moggett says, yeah, I know, and I know what Caragor is, but I can't speak of it because of the binding. Chapter 9, they go on. And Moggett has told her about the paper wing, says, I'm going to come with you. 156. <coughs> She's thinking. If she was now Abhorson, who was her father? Had he too once had a name that was lost in the responsibility of being Abhorson? I'm trying to remember if that's the name of the book that just. I'm going to give something away here in case you're interested in the other books. Pretty sure. I might be wrong about this, but I don't think I am. Yes, he does have a name, by the way. Um, everything that had seemed so certain and solid in her life a few days ago was crumbling. She didn't even know who she was, really, and trouble seemed to beset her from all sides. Even a supposed servant of Abhorsen like Moggett seemed to provide more trouble than service, right? So, she wakes up one morning, a few days previous, right, when the novel kind of opens after the prologue, in, you know, everything she's known starts to fall apart. And now she's thrown into this, you know, great high quest, so to speak. So Margaret says, I'm coming after, I'm coming to look after you until you've grown into a real ab horse. Okay? So he tells her, you know, where they need to head towards. And 162, 63. He says to her, you're going to need this if I'm to come with you. And he comes up and he spits something out of his mouth like a hairball. All right? Because he's a cat. But it's metal. It's not a hairball. What is it? She bends down and she picks it up. It's a ring. A small silver ring with a ruby gripped between two silver claws that grow to the band. Margaret says, when she says, what is it? He says, oh. Well, that's one answer to the question. She's asking, what kind of thing is it? He says, you'll know if you need to use it. Put it on. She looks at it. It felt and looked quite ordinary. No charter marks on the stoner band. It seemed to have no emanation or aura. She puts it on. It's cold as she slips it down her finger. Then hot, and suddenly she was falling, falling into infinity. Which is another way of describing what? If it's infinity, that is, no distinctions, no boundaries, it's like falling into nothingness and just falling. Everything was gone, all light all substance. Then charter marks suddenly exploded all around her, and she felt gripped by them, halting her headlong fall into nothing, accelerating her back up, back into her body, back to the world of life and death. Okay? So she falls into beyond life and death. What does she fall into? What, theoretically, philosophically, religiously possibly, is beyond life and death. Eternity. Eternity, time, E, outside of. Timelessness. All right? 
And she says, free magic. Why? It's unbound. It's uncontrolled. It's undistinguished. Free magic. Connected to the charter. Free, and yet it's tied to. That's why she says, I don't understand. How, this is a contradiction in terms. How can these two things be connected? You'll know if you need to use it. Notice, he doesn't give, you know, a nice handy dandy, here's the, here's the instructions for how to use this ring. Don't worry about it till then. That is, don't even think about the ring till then. So they go on. Okay. We find out, you know, this this silver, this paper wing. It's a paper airplane, essentially. Full of charter marks. Right? She gets into it. She kind of automatically knows how it works. Why? Because she's an person. And a previous app person made it. Okay. But they get attacked by gore crows, which are these birds of death. They're literally spirits of the dead in crows. Okay. So some necromancer has called dead spirits out, put them in these crows, and they get attacked by them. And you know, winds come and such. And they're spiraling down. 178.79. And as they get closer and closer and closer to the ground, <coughs> Moggett says, loose my collar. <laughs> Take my collar off. Now, what does she know about Moggett? She, he's a free magic being. You, you don't want to mess with those things. She looks at him, she looks at the ground. It would only be used, the collar, uh, middle of 179, would only be used to contain an inexpressible evil, comma, or uncontrollable force. Trust me, loose my collar, and remember the ring. And she says, Father, forgive me, and takes the collar off. And when she opens her eyes, the collar simply ceased to exist. Within a few seconds, 180, there was no cat shape left, just a shiny blur too bright to look at. It seemed to hesitate for a moment, and Sabriel felt its attention flicker between aggression towards her and some inner struggle. It formed back almost into its cat shape again, then split into four shafts of brilliant white. One shot forward, one aft, and two onto the wings. Why? It's taking control. So it brings the plane down relatively controlled, right? Because what happens to the plane when it lands? I mean, it's kind of destroyed. Okay. <coughs> Notice what could, I don't know what you call it at this point, because it's not Moggit. What could the thing have done? At that point, once it was released from the power or the control of the collar, left, and she would have spiraled into the ground and died. Okay? So it comes down. It, Sabriel cheered as the paper wing gently lay its belly on the grass, slid to what should have been the perfect landing. Cheer suddenly became a shriek of alarm as the grass parted to reveal the lip of an enormous dark hole directly in their path. That is, it was landing fine and then sinkhole, you know, and it crashed down into that. She comes to chapter 12, lights a match, kind of looks around. She sees the paper wing, you know, scattered here and there. And then she thinks 184. Where's Moggett? Or what was Moggett? And what was it? And that makes her think of sword bells. 
Notice what she doesn't immediately think of. Ring. <laughs> it told her, remember the ring. She goes up to the remains of the plane, touches it, and apologizes. Sentiment abhorsent, 185. Said a voice that kind of sounded like Mogget and didn't sound like her. It was louder, harsher, less human. Every word seemed to cackle like the electric generators. Well, she asks, where are you? Here. And she sees lines of white fire come out from under the fuselage. And then this blue-white blazing creature steps out from the funeral pyre in the paper room, 186. She couldn't look at it directly, but from the corners of her arm-shielded eyes, she sees something human in shape, taller, thin, almost dark. Doesn't have legs, torso and head balanced upon a column of twisting, whirling force. What is twisting, whirling force? Like a tornado? Free, save for the blood of Christ. In other words, I've got to have blood in order to be really free. Now that kind of sounds maybe a little bit like what that we've seen earlier. How did Cloven Crest get Cloven? Sacrificing the Thomas. Charter Major sacrificed Thomas. Thomas almost sounds like whatever Margaret that was is saying, I need blood. Okay. She had no doubt about the meaning of blood price and who would pay it, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. And so she starts summoning charter marks. She starts thinking bottom of 187 of the bells. The Mogget thing, you know, starts throwing out these tendrils and it has her in its grasp. 188, pity your head doesn't work too well. She says, you saved it from not working forever. Sentiment. The memory now. I don't remember that anymore. In other words, I'm I'm back. I'm you know what I always was. Bottom of 189. Millennia of servitude. Abhorson. Chained by trickery, treachery, captive in a repulsive fixed flesh shape. There will be payment, slow payment, not quick, not quick at all. Notice you're going to be the one to pay for what. Hundreds of years. Okay. And so it sends out those tendrils of light, you know, that grasp her and bring it towards it. And it kind of tilts its head up to eat her. <clears throat> 191. She's tired and her mind remembers the ring. It's on her left hand. Her right arm is bound. Her left hand's kind of up like this. And she sees the ring on her index finger. The creature's head is bowing down towards her own. Its neck stretching long like a snake's. And she kind of gets her hand up over it. And the ring suddenly starts to feel loose on her finger. She curls her hand. The ring feels looser still, slipping down her finger, expanding, growing, till without looking, middle of 191. Sabriel knew she held the silver hoop as wider, wider than the creature's slender head. And she knew what she had to do. And the thing says, first I'm going to start with your eye. It's going to eat her slowly, bit by bit. Okay? She closes her eyes, and she does this, and flips the hoop until it falls over the thing's neck. Okay? And it shrinks, and all of a sudden, there's Mogget again, and what does he do? He pops up, not a hairball, but the ring again. He tells her, he knows it's bleeding, and she says, welcome back, Mogget. Okay, so here's the question. Mogget brings her the ring. He knows what the ring will do. Why does he tell her what to do with it? 
Why does he bring it to her? Why doesn't he just say, you know, time will come, you're going to need this, and the time will come that you're going to need to unloose me? Why does he give her the means to put himself back into subjugation, into slavery? So they make the way, I'm not going to answer it. So they make their way around and they find these ships. Okay? It's a burial ground of ships. And they find one, page 204. Third one's different. It's got a figurehead. Figurehead is of a naked man. Full body anatomically correct, we're even told he's circumcised. And she's kind of, you know, she blushes. It's a wooden figure, and yet she blushes. Why? Not just a wooden figure. She senses something. Two lifelike 205. And then she realizes this thing has the baptismal mark on its forehead. You don't put that on statues. That's only put on living people. All right? So, she decides she's going to go into death to bring him back. Notice, that's what? That's necromancy. He's not fully dead. He's, you know, partially dead. Okay. But we're told, 207, Samuel felt sure her father would free the man. That's what he did. That's what, that was what he lived for. The duty of an abhorson was to remedy unnatural necromancy in free magic sorcery. And what she is suggesting with that, excuse me, is this guy shouldn't be like this. This is, this is essentially what? He's been trapped in this thing. Okay. So she goes into death. I'm going to skip a bunch. And she brings him out. 214. Or she thought she did. It hadn't changed at all. The figure had 214 at the bottom. So she's back into life. She traces his face with her fingers. Mog it. A kiss, you know. Kiss would do it. Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella. You know. Actually, just breathing would do it. But you have to start kissing someone sometime, I suppose. You know, you are 18. He's obviously 18, you know. Turns out he's like 218. Okay. And she says, really? And she goes out and breathes on him. And he starts to wake. Okay. He thanks her and says, 216, thank you, Abhorson. He doesn't say, thank you, whoever you are. This is an immediate recognition. She looks down at him, trying to ignore a curiously fond feelings that appear from somewhere, feeling similar to those that had made her bring back Jacinth Rabbit. And she says, I guess I better get him a blanket, and she just sits there and stares, and Moggy's like, <clears throat> okay, so, while she goes away, Moggy and the young man talk to each other, 220, 221, what are you, he says to the cat, he says, I'm a faithful retainer of the F person. And the man says, 221 at the top, you were bigger when you last saw me. In other words, I know you. Have we met? I, I don't remember. What was your name? Huh. And the guy doesn't answer. He just growls. Mind if I call you Touchstone? What? That's a... Fool's name. Why? Shakespeare uses it. 
one of his it's great. As you like it. Yeah, I think it's as you like it, right? Margaret, is it unfitting? You do remember what you've done. And the memories start to flood back. Yes, I do. You may call me touchdown. And I'll call you, ah, you can't. The, the, the binding magic. Okay. So they talk. Margaret tells them, you've been dead for 200 years. You're all your family's dead. All dead and past the final gate, save one who should be 223. You know who I mean. And the man starts just weeping uncontrollably. No point crying over it. Pl plenty of people have died trying to put them out of the ranks. Four abhorsons have fallen in this century alone. My current abhorson certainly isn't lying around crying her eyes out. Make yourself useful and help her, right? He says, I'm not fit to wield royal, blah, 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 blah. Indicating he is royalty. But he's not going to call on that. He's going to pretend to be what? Sabriel's servant. Okay. So she comes back. He calls her my lady. She says, don't call me that. Just call me Sabriel. I'm only 18. Just... <coughs> he tells her to call him Touchstone. Talks about fighting with blade and charter magic. We were all charter mages, etc., etc. 2.30, he says, I'll help you fight against the enemies of the kingdom. Okay. Calls her my lady again. She tells him to stop. Um, let's see here. So, she has some best way to get to Bellis here. He explains... And they go on their way. Um, I'm skipping stuff I've got marked up. Let me just... They make their way to the stair to get out of Hole Hollow. 246. Yeah, they, they come to the doors. 246. And Touchstone puts his hands on the doors and says, it feels strange. The wood humming beneath his hand like plucked lute strings. Sabriel, I can hear voices. Her ears full of half-caught words, laughter, distant singing. Mogget, I can see the time. Why? What is he feeling? What is she hearing? Seemingly voices outside of time, people outside, dead. Okay. The doors are open, they walk through. Page 247. Sabriel asks, Would one of you care to tell me something I really want to know? Like, what are the great charters? Mike, I can't says Moggett and Touchstone together. Why? It's part of their spell that's binding them. A child, perhaps, baptized with the charter mark, but not grown into power, could do that. Several. Why would a child know? Well, if you'd have a proper education, you'd know too. Where did she get her education? Waverly College, down in Anchelsphere. Notice, she's telling us. She doesn't even know what the charters are. What these are. Which is why when they go to that little fishing village, she meets the little girl, the little five, six year old, whatever, however old she is, and she says, Can you tell me about the great charters? And she does it in a manner of, okay, let's see how well educated you are. I obviously know them, so you tell them to me. Okay? And the girl does, and that's why she learns. Um they go on, they find more dead. She, you know, sends them back into the dead. They see the island. And this is where they meet the people. All the people have gone off to the island because there are dead in the town. And people in the island start shooting at them. Page 260. 
shooting at them with bows and arrows. And we're told, instantly Touchstone rushed in front of Sabriel. She felt the flow of charter magic from him, his sword sketching a great circle in the air in front of them both. Glowing lines followed the sword's path till a shining circle hung in the air. Kind of like, you know, Doctor Strange, you know, does the thing with the circles and such. And she's like, cool. Ensorcelled swords, you know, they've got spells woven in them, okay? He explains who he is to the townsfolk. Explains Sabriel is, is Abhorson and such. Okay. 265, he has to explain to her why he has to say what he said, that he's the sword swordsman of the Abhorson, because otherwise it looks like what? As he puts it, uh -oh. 265, it is traditional for someone of high rank, such as yourself, to be announced by their sword swordsman. The only acceptable way for me to travel with you is as your sword, your sworn swordsman. Otherwise, people will assume that we are, at best, illicit lovers. Illicit, illegal. Okay? Having your name coupled to mine in such a guise would lower you in most eyes. Your name, and person, with Touchstone, you know, our version of Touchstone would just be damn fool. And she's like, okay, thank you. So, chapter, what is that, 17. They go on and meet the villagers. They go off to, out to the island. They talk with the elder. And the elder says, you know, I remember the Abhorsen when I was young. And he says, 269, he told me his purpose was to slay the dead. <laughs> He's kind of throwing that out there, you know, are you going to do the same? She says, I will ensure the island is free of the dead. Notice, I'm not going to free the coastal town, but the island, yes. And when I help get rid of the great evil that's in the kingdom, then we'll come back and we'll free the town of the dead. Right? We'll restore the charter stone, the whole nine yards. So they kind of start looking around, not just with their physical eyes, but with the you know charter magic -y eyes, and they find the dead. And she and Touchstone get rid of him. That's when, page 277, she notices the swords are enchanted and such. They realize the Mordecant is still following. Where did, we, where did we first meet the Mordecant? Or first hear about it? Back at Clovencrest, when she raises you know, the, the dead to speak, and the Mordecant hears, Thralt hears and such, right? <clears throat> so this thing, this servant of Caragor, is still following her. And that's when, 284, she meets the little girl, black hair tied in two plates, one on either side of her head. Seeing her made Sabriel remember something Touchstone had said, that is, about a child and the charter. What's your name, little one? A feeling of deja vu swept over her as the small fingers met hers, the memory of a frightened first grader hesitantly reaching out to the older people who would be her guide for the first day at Wyverley College. She had experienced both sides in her time. That is, she remembered being the little girl reaching up to the older student who would be her guide, and she remembered being the older student reaching down to a new first-year student. Tell me what you have learned in your lessons about the Great Charter. Five great charters knit the land, linked together hand in hand. So they form a chain. One of the people who wear the crown. That is, one of the charters is in the royalty. Kings, queens, etc. Okay. Two in the folk who keep the dead down. In the ab horses. Three and five 
became stone and mortar, stone and mortar. Stone and mortar together make up what? Wall. Okay. And charter stones. So charter stones and the wall. Okay. Four sees all in frozen water. We have no idea what that is until we get to the next book. Well. No, we do get a, a bit of an indication of that in this book, okay? So, Moggett says, now you know. So now you know what the five great charters are. are. Does she? Or does she just know the great charters are in these things? That's what it is. She still doesn't know what the great charters themselves are. Okay. Sabriel. Uh, okay, so, hmm. Top of 286. Two, two in the folk who keep the dead down. So, and then she realizes she can't talk about it. One of the great charters lay in the royal blood. That was clear. The second lay in ab horses. What were three and five? In four that saw all in frozen water. She felt certain many answers could be found in Belisar. Her father could probably answer more. Many things that were bound in life were unraveled in death. That is, many things that were hidden in life are made clear in death. And there was her mother sending for that third and final questioning in this seven years. In chapter 18, um, they go on. Let's see here. 297. They're out of the boat. They're now in the ocean. The ocean is obviously what? Very obviously. Running water. Okay? So they're away from all, you know, evil spirit things, so to speak. <clears throat> and they start to talk. 297, bottom of the page. Touchstone. It was stupidity on my part, not evil, my lady. 200 years ago, when the last queen reigned, I think, I know that I'm partly responsible for the failing of the kingdom, the end of the royal line. She's like, what? How? And he says, I am. He says, I don't know how much I can tell you because it involves a great charge. Where do I start with the queen, I guess? She had four children. Oldest son, Roger, was a childhood playmate of mine. He was always the leader in all our games. He had the ideas, blah, blah, blah. Okay? So I went into the guard. He pursued his own interests. Towards the end, I mean, a few months before it happened, Roger had been away for several years. He came back late one afternoon, 299. And what does he spill? What had happened? Okay. Middle of 299. He says, Roger came to her, asked her to come down with him, come with him down to the place where the great stones are. And he realizes, what are you talking about? Margaret, yes. <laughs> the sea washes all things clear. We can speak of the great charters, at least for a little while. Okay, so pause here for a moment. What should they do at this point? Drop anchor, spill the beans. Just talk about it. Or at the very least, if not drop anchor, don't sail into the Bay of Belisar. I mean, stay out there. And... But that would kind of defeat the purposes of the plot construction of the novel. So, she says, the great stones would be the stones and mortar of the rhyme, the third and fifth great charter. Touchstone, yes, within the wall. The people, or whatever they were who made the great charters, put three in bloodlines, two in physical constructions, the wall and the great stones. So, bloodline, 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 all right, and the stones and the wall and such. 
So the great stones. Roger came, said there was something to look into, something was wrong. Bottom of 300, there was something wrong. But it was what Roger did, not something he discovered. Okay. What happened? 301. Two other guards were Roger's men. Touchstone continued. They attacked me, but Blair, one of the lady ladies, one of the ladies in waiting, excuse me, threw herself across them. I went mad, battle mad, berserk. Berserk literally means bear shirt. It's an old Norse term. Okay, related to the Vikings. I killed both guards. Roger had jumped from bars, was waiting to the stones, holding the cups. His four sorcerers were waiting, dark cowled around the third stone, the next to be broken. So he'd started breaking the stones, killing people with them, etc. Okay. <coughs> he says, uh, 302, he came within an arm's length of me. I could only look at his face, look at the evil that lay so close. Behind those familiar features, there was blinding white light. Where have we seen that? Mogget uncollared. Sound of bells, bells like yours, voices, harsh voices, Roger flinching back, the cup dropped, blood floating. Then I fainted, and when I came to, it was you. You should have told me. Uh, hello? He couldn't have told her, right? Until just now. But perhaps they had to wait for the seas freezing, okay? So they keep talking. Moggett says, I was there with the apportion of that time. Char powerful charter mage, master of bells, a little too good hearted. Okay. Bottom of 304. Yeah, take that back. Middle of 304. They're talking about Roger and stuff. He was the queen's son, clever, powerful, almost achieved his aims. Two of the six great stones broken, the queen and her daughters killed. Ab Horson intervened a little bit too late. He did manage to drive him deep into death. But since his body has never been found, what? Rogers continued to exist. Notice, what has to happen for the individual to fully die? Something's got to be done to the body, too. Okay? The, the body and the soul are connected. Even from death, he has overseen the dissolution of a kingdom. A kingdom without a royal family, with one of the great charters crippled. That is, this one. Okay? Sabriel, he succeeded, hasn't he? He's the thing called Caragorn, the one Ab Orsons have been fighting for generations trying to keep him dead. He's the one who came back, the greater dead, who murdered the patrol near Cloven Crest. Maga, I don't know. Your father thought so. It is him, said Touchstone. Caragor was Roger's childhood nickname. I made it up on the day we had the mud fight. His full ceremonial name was Rogerick. Reverse it, Caragor. Notice, what has a touchstone said? Was he just a guard? <laughs> Little brother. Okay. So, they get closer to the shore, page 306, and Ab Horson defeated him once. I can do so again. But we got to find my father's body. One thing I would like to ask, my, uh, Touchstone asks, who put my spirit in death, made my body the figurehead? That is, somebody had to do that. Somebody kept me alive by doing that. Maga, I never knew. It must have been Abhorson. You were insane when we got you out of the reservoir, driven mad probably by the breaking of great stones. It seems 200 years is not too long for a rescuer. He must have seen something in you, or the clear saw something, and he can't finish. Why? We're getting close to land. The binding comes back. No! You know, my, uh, 
She needs to get the answers, but she doesn't. So, chapter 19. Um, they decide where they're probably going to find her father's body is back under the palace. That is, where what occurred. where Roger slew his mother and sisters. Back in that reservoir under the palace where there were six great stones, now there are only four remaining ones. So they're going to have to make their way up there. Okay, we'll stop there. We'll pick up. Yeah, I think we might be able to finish. We'll pick up with chapter 20 on Thursday and try to go to the end. I'll try to get a... I'll get a quiz up for this uh, by Thursday evening. Wait until we finish discussing it. That'll then be due Sunday. I know I've still got to do an exam for the um, Bartimaeus books. I'm going to try and get that up today. It'll also be due Sunday. All right. Why are you not waking me up? That's right.